Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us at this 3 p.m. Super Salone talk. Um, the talk today is about women within institutions. Very interesting subject. I think we'll have a lively discussion. We'll have a discussion about issues of diversity and equity. Of course, this is very prevalent at the moment. It's under scrutiny now more than ever, which is a good thing. We'll be investigating why many of our major international design museums and cultural institutions have for too long been deprived of a female point of view. And our panel, who I'll introduce in a second, will discuss their roles, their responsibilities, and importantly, their goals to remedy this rather shameful historical imbalance. So, we are very privileged to have with us Tolga Baelle, who is director of the Hamburg Museum of Applied Arts. We have Alexandra Cunningham Cameron, who is the curator of contemporary design at the Cooper Ewart Smithsonian Design Museum but today is speaking from an independent perspective. And then we are joined by the wonders of technology via satellite or Zoom by Lily Holine. Here is Lily, the technology works. And Lily is the director of the MAC in Vienna. And Lily is online today because she actually started her new role at the MAC just this week. Is that right, Lily? It's uh, right, uh, it's uh, not even a week that, that I have been in service at the moment. Not <laughs> even, well, so we are very privileged that she's taken her time out um, to join us here for this discussion. And we'll be hearing a lot more from Lily later about what she plans and what her goals are. So I thought I'd start today with getting a little bit of biographical um, information from our three speakers. Um, some biography about what they've done in the past, and their current roles, and also the institutions at which they are so uh, busy, changing, bringing ideas to look into the future. So I'd like to start with Tolga, who will tell us about herself and show some imagery from things she's done, and particularly also about what she's doing in Hamburg. Tolga. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Very um, delighted and honored to be invited by the fair and to be with you here on stage. Um, I am director of the Museum of Applied Arts in Hamburg, which is called Museum für Kunst und Gewerbe. And uh, it's one of the classic historical museums. It's like, uh, you know, like a daughter of the V&A. Um, so the V&A was uh, founded 1852, I think, and, and the museum in Hamburg is 1877. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, and it's also funny because there's a coincidence and a, and a connection to the MAC because the director, the founding director of the museum in Hamburg was originally, um, was really impressed by Vienna. So Vienna is the first museum in um, the continent and, and the MAC in, and the MKNG in Hamburg is like a follow of that. So, um, oh, that works. So a very short introduction. Um, I'm from Vienna. Uh, I've been studied design actually. Then I worked as a university assistant in theory and history of design in Vienna at the University of Applied Arts. And then I became self-employed for 13 years. And amongst that, I worked with Lily very closely together because we founded the Vienna Design Week together and did that until I left um, the beginning of 2014. I became director of a museum in Dresden where I worked five years. I'm in Hamburg now since the end of 2018. Um, there you go, it worked before, now it doesn't. Why, next slide, oh, there, there it is, perfect. So here you see the building of the museum, which um, also important is actually a school building. The museum was just taking us a small part of it. So this, the, the connection of the museums and the schools was always a very important part and you can feel it in the building. That's how it looked finished. Uh, now, um, in the middle of the city, you can't really see where we are. It's too little, but we are next to the main station now, surrounded by the a really big city, Hamburg. And it's an exemplary collection. Um, so this is also something I love to talk about because these collections have been put together to inspire designers, producers, and consumers alike. 
and I think the collections are like the core and the heart of the museum and to work with them and make them speak is one of the most challenging things to do uh, because exhibitions is one thing but uh, to work with the collection is another so these are historic images um, this is, uh, you know, other images of the collection. We have quite a broad collection, so we have over 600,000 objects in our collection. The museum, so it goes from antiquity, uh, from East Asian collection, Near East, um, musical instruments, photography, graphic design, posters, fashion, textile, um, arts and crafts and design. And the building, uh, we're presenting that on 10,000 square meter exhibition space and uh, in a 20,000 square meter building, it's not the Smithsonian and not <laughs> compared to the really big ones, but for Germany and it's one of the biggest in, in um, there. And I also figured, uh, looking at that, I'm the third female director in the history of the museum and uh, the second in a row, the, the lady before me, the director before me was a wonderful person as well. Um, yeah, just other wonderful images of the collection. Moving on, moving on, just to give you an idea. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an image I wanted to share because this is, as I said, an, a super challenging question. How do you present a collection? How do you work with objects that are historical? How do you make them speak? How do you ask them the right questions? To, to, to unveil their stories, to unveil maybe their making, to unveil the context without only just telling didactic, uh, you know, chronological, how does this has design developed? And that's something that um, I'm, I'm really busy working on, especially when you have to take care of a big collection. Um, so we are starting to do work like uh, we're presenting things and then inviting people to, to maybe find connections between objects, tell their own stories, get them close to the things, to work with them, to uh, write their own card that is then added to the piece, um, work in the space. Um, it's just a different way of making pieces of a museum accessible. An experiment, I have to say, but an important one. Or um, expanding the notion of an exhibition. What is an exhibition actually do with us? Uh, in this case, we invited Jersey Seymour to work with us and he developed uh, an amazing space where, which was more space of working, living, jamming, discussing, uh, enjoying your time. But it was also a space where uh, Jersey asked the question, how do we want to live in the future? So it was not at all a classic uh, didactic exhibition. It's unfortunately, one of the things that kind of missed out through Corona, through COVID. And another really important project to me is uh, opening a main space. space uh, we opened it last September called the Freiraum, the free space which is um, you know, really in the center of the building. And the idea is that we offer a consumer-free and safe space for working, discussing, uh, meeting, relaxing. So um, now it's really working really well. So it's not empty like you see it here. It's full of people that use it for different, for different purposes. Some work, others gather. Sometimes people meet to then go out in the city. For example, last year we had a group of old ladies that met once a week to then after that go pro protesting in front of the mayor's house in the city center for peace. I don't know, but they found our place great to meet. So if that's what it does, if that is uh, you know, an invitation for people who usually do not enter our museums who feel you know, yeah, they're, they're maybe scared, they don't know, um, they feel the doors are too heavy, uh, the, the expectations of how to behave are too high, so they wouldn't come. So this was really, this is one of my uh, main things uh, I wanted to do, and, it's, and I'm very happy that it's working well, with the idea that in the end our audience has come up with their own ideas what they would like to do. So in a way, this space is probably where we experiment the most with diversity, um, you know, being an, a welcoming gesture instead of, usually museums very often have this gesture of, I tell you, I'm, I'm sharing my knowledge with you, and we are actually very interested in getting the knowledge of our audiences to enrich our own knowledge as so well. So it's inclusive in 
the literal sense you're including very, the emergency. Very, yeah. Yes, exactly. It's also free of charge, so you don't have to pay when you go in. Um, and and there's a yeah, it's like like a, and and it becomes a center focus in this in the whole museum because it's. It, the, the people that take care of it, there's always somebody there, like a, like a host. So they're very much looking into what are the exhibitions and how can we echo the exhibition in the space and at the same time, how can things from outside become resonate inside the museum. So that is it, more or less. Yeah, that was from my side. So Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tilga. I, I, we'll come back to more direct questions. Um, some of the things that were, uh, you raised there, and that area of ex inclusivity, without it being overly designed, it's just a natural opening arms, in a sense, which I find interesting. Um, before that, though, we will hear from Lily, so we're going to be switching to the technology of, um, of Zoom or one other, so give, the, give Luigi some challenges. Hi again, Lily. Hi. Yeah. Hi again. Um, I was asked to not over challenge and uh, therefore no presentation. Uh, I'll just briefly... You are uh, in a sense a living presentation, that's what we thought. You are there as a... you, you, you are a slideshow. So. In, in my still uh, pretty empty office because um, uh, I changed uh, the director's office as, as one of, of my first uh, acts and um, um, changed to a very different uh, room. Uh, so yeah, um, as, as uh, Tony mentioned before, I have just uh, taken over my position as uh, director at the MAC uh, uh, last week. Um, Tulga made a fantastic introduction. We have worked so many years side by side. Uh, the synchronicity is, is uh, strong uh, between the institutions and in our biographies. So uh, I have just uh, stepped down as uh, director of uh, Vienna Design Week that I founded together with uh, Tulga and our colleague uh, Thomas. Uh, after 15 years, so I, I was uh, the one to uh, guided uh, until the May of this year and um, yeah, now running the MAC, uh, which is, uh, uh, as Tuga said, the first uh, uh, museum on the continent uh, for uh, uh, decorative arts. It uh, was founded in 1863 uh, with an eye on promoting innovation. It is, uh, again, a, sam a sample collection, just as, as Tulga's Museum in Hamburg, uh, which is important in a city uh, like Vienna, where we have so many imperial and royal uh, collections. These collections was, uh, was not meant to be an aristocratic uh, view, but uh, uh, yeah, rather uh, an, uh, from scratch, a collection from scratch that that looked at uh, innovation, uh, which is exciting. And um, yeah, and uh, uh, other than in Hamburg, I am the first uh, female director ever in the history of uh, this institution. And um, it's frankly the first institution that I'm part of in this sense. So, uh, I mean, if you say Vienna Design Week is one, uh, maybe, but uh, uh, until uh, now I was as, uh, as a journalist and a curator and as director of Vienna Design Week, not uh, integrated in, in uh, an institution like this. So it's a big change for you. It's a, it's a double first in a sense that you're talking and because you've only just started there we're not going to drill you and ask you what changes you've made already apart from the office you've changed offices well but maybe the 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 office is um i mean the the former office that uh um uh i had the uh, uh, peter Növer, the director before christoph thun hohenstein uh, took over a former collection room as uh, the director's office an enormous and beautiful office but uh, um, i rather felt uh, let's make it accessible to the public again uh, and uh, 
I think this is one of, of, uh, of the things that describe very much what uh, I'd like to achieve at the MAC, to, to open uh, doors, uh, to uh, make uh, accessible, to make uh, public uh, spaces within the museum ground. We have a garden, we have uh, uh, a main hall uh, that I'd like to be uh, publicly accessible. And um, all of this also with the goal to raise diversity, to, uh, as the first female director, uh, tell also stories in, in our collection. We have, we have uh, numerous pieces and donations, for instance, the laces by Bertha Pappenheim, who is an extremely interesting, uh, was a uh, woman, uh, it's an extremely interesting biography, so I'd, I'd like to to make our collection also accessible by telling stories that uh, some of them have never been told. And uh, to also, uh, yeah, look at, at the points where women were marginalized uh, in, uh, for instance, team roles uh, that happened very often. Mm -hmm. And one first step that I'm not responsible for, but I'm very happy that I take the museum over at this moment. We have a show currently running on the women of the Wiener Werkstätte. Uh, and I think this is a brilliant moment for me to start uh, the new chapter. Yes, yeah, it's almost meant to be. And you've made, you've made one change already. You've, you've done this thing with the office, which is a clear sign, a statement of opening the place up. Well, thank you very much, Lily. We'll again address some of those things a little later. I'd now like to return to in real life and to Alexandra. Please thank, tell us thank you, Tony. about your... I think you're very brave for moderating this panel. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to go easy on you. Lots of people have said that. <laughs> um, I have three elder sisters, so <laughs> I know how to deal with <laughs> with being picked on. <laughs> oh, good, good. Uh, I'm so happy to be here in, um, in person, and thanks to the Salone and Maria Cristina for, for having me. Um, as Tony said, I'm Alexandra. Uh, I grew up in, in Miami, uh, and my career in the design world happened, I wouldn't say accidentally, but almost. In my background is in literature. I was studying critical theory and um, diasporic literatures. And after getting my master's, I said, you know, before I move to a very tiny town in the middle of the United States and get my PhD and sort of disappear into the library, I should try to do something that I really enjoy doing. And I'd always loved architecture and design. Um, and I was introduced by a friend um, to Ambrometta, who was the director of Design Miami at the time. Uh, and I convinced her to hire me in 2007 with zero experience um, and worked at the fair for a very long time. Um, and, and some of my interest there was about developing new access points to the public to design and architecture. And so I was very interested in, in the visitor experience of the of the fair. Um, these images are uh, a little bit cut off, but you can see some of the, thank you, the projects that I worked on. Um, one um, with the architects of Randall Ash was um, an overwhelming redesign of the fair experience, something that's perhaps interesting to look at uh, in this particular context, what happens when you scatter these really regular neighborhoods, you know, in a, in a convention hall, what does that create? Um, how do you take people out of highway hypnosis? Um, pavilions with American architects, you see an image there of a pav pavilion designed by um, Jonathan Mickey, who's based in Minneapolis, uh, a project that I organized with Judith Sang, uh, a German designer acting things where she was uh, had choreographed um, a troupe of dancers who were creating objects with the movements of their bodies. Um, and, and after Design Miami, I began to work on um, more public projects in neighborhoods. I worked with developers as an advisor. Uh, you see a project, a couple of projects that were realized in Miami, the Burlak Brothers Nuage installation of um, shading and, and ponds, um, a, a project by 
the artist Jamila Sabor, which was inspired by her work with geometry and, and the conceptual artist Vito Acconci. Um, and something I co-curated with Jean Moreno at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Miami, uh, the first uh, public project of Yona Friedman in the United States, which we were, we were very lucky to realize um, very soon before he, before he died. And that's a sketch of one of his works, which I, I thought was perhaps more compelling for this presentation. Um, and I began to do some more independent institutional curating at regional museums in the United States who didn't have uh, design curatorial staff. This is an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art Tucson um, with the Tohono O'odham basket weaver, Terrell Drew Johnson, and the architects, Aranda Lash, called Meeting the Clouds Halfway, where they were looking at coiling um, and the relationship with the algorithms and how you could build from a basket scale to a scale of architecture. Uh, and then I, I played around a lot in publishing and writing, which is really a passion of mine. Um, for some years, I was uh, editor-in-chief of the Miami Rail, which is an independent arts publication, the sister paper of the Brooklyn Rail, which covered architecture, design, literature, art, um, from the perspective of, of Miami as a gateway um, to the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, into a book that I published uh, with Cooper Hewitt and Rizzoli connected to my first exhibition at the museum, Willie Smith Street Couture. Um, and then a project that has become, I think it sort of snuck up on me and has become really influential in the way that I, I've begun working, especially during COVID times in the last year or so. Um, I co-authored with, with 15 other colleagues across different museums and different um, areas of the museum, different departments, um, something called uh, Tools and Approaches for Transforming Museum Experience. It's a, it's a toolkit that came out of a series of workshops um, and has now turned into a class that I'm co-teaching um, at the Harvard Extension School of Museum Studies with one of my colleagues um, who was involved in this and who initiated it, R Rachel Ginsberg at the uh, Cooper Hewitt Interaction Lab. Um, and then just quickly, I've, I've only been at Cooper Hewitt for three years, um, and my position is a, is a curator of contemporary design and hence secretarial, secretarial scholar. It's a title that even I stumble over um, and, and never fits on, um, on uh, any sort of graphic layout anyway. But the first exhibition that I, I curated at the exhibition at the museum has been down for a year, but just reopened in, in June um, and will be up until October. It's called Willie Smith Street Couture, and it is the first um, museum survey dedicated to the American fashion designer, Willie Smith, um, who passed of AIDS complications in 1987. And the exhibition is dedicated to his work really as a designer um, pushing forward fashion as a tool for social equity, social justice. And it emphasizes his collaborations with artists, um, Nam Jun Paik, Juan Downey, um, uh, Bill T. Jones and Arne Zane, um, the dancer choreographers, uh, site architects. Um, and it's really been uh, an incredible experience working with this. And just lastly, um, alongside the exhibition, we produced with um, support from Cargo an experiment in online archiving called the Willie Smith um, Digital Community Archive. And this project also launched March 13th, which was the day that all the museums closed in New York as a result of COVID and has really had a life of its own. Um, I'm not quite sure how to make this play but if we could make it play, then I, I, could talk, no, we, I can talk over it, but I can, yes. So this is, this is just a short video sort of showing you the experience of the archive. But what we wanted to do was to try to make as accessible as possible our research as curators, but also the process of building this show, um, which came from many, many conversations with people who knew Willie Smith, who collaborated with him, who cared about him, who were fans from afar. And we were so uh, overwhelmed by how 
this community of people had sort of carried us forward in our research and really provided fundamental information that allowed us not to just build uh, a collection of objects to put on view, but also an understanding of this designer whose work hadn't, um, for the most part, been acquired in mass by institutional archives. It was very difficult to find examples of the clothing. And, and so we wanted to create a space not just to share their stories from first-person perspectives, but to open up the process of collaboration to the public. And so we did an open call um, that is still ongoing, and we've been collecting stories, additional images of um, uh, garments that people wore to their proms, to postcards that Willie Smith sent to them, um, to uh, sketches from people who worked in the design studio, and it's been a tremendous way to you know, allow the sort of messiness and imperfection of a curatorial process that's typically presented in a very refined way to open up further dialogue about a designer's life and, and not just you know, the professional practice, but also their impact as, as, a, as a human being and how that can live on even, even 40 years um, after, after their death. I mean, something that is probably very familiar to us here. Um, so I'm excited to, to speak with everyone on stage today. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. No, I think so that's thanks for having me. Wonderful, it. Alexander. Um, and that last example of how te technology can be such, a, such a, an important assistance and an aid. So it's open source research, really. You're getting stories from about Willie that would have been lost forever, I would have thought. Um, no, wonder, wonderful. And the show is on until you extended it, I hope? October 24th. Oh, not long. We've got to go soon. Yeah. But at least because it was, again, most of the time it was during this terrible past year. But thank you all very much. I told you they were, they were good and had a lot to offer. Before we dig a little bit deeper into the, the theme, I wanted to just give three, actually four examples, because I discovered a fourth example last night, um, that maybe illustrates um, the lack of a female perspective or maybe in the canon of, of design, design history, curating, cataloging the canon of design. And we all know, you know, there has been very poorly represented. And actually some examples of, of downright misogyny um, in this wonderful industry that we work in. Um, they're all too familiar, unfortunately, and so you'll know some of the stories. I have to thank two great um, women journalists and curators who I source these from, Alice Rawsthorne, um, so a couple of these from her Instagram or even face-to-face, uh, -face, but also Lily's, Libby Sellers, uh, the curator and writer who told me the last one at the last minute. But um, Ray Eames, Ray Eames, 50% of Charles and Ray Eames, the design company. Alice Rawsthorne wrote recently that when the Eameses, it's a terrible story this, when the Eameses attended a design award ceremony in London, at the height of their career, Charles was given a medal. Ray was given a rose. <laughs> Very nice. Um, even worse, when they appeared on NBC's The Today Show, the presenter, who was female, in fact, introduced Ray with a cringy line, and this is Mrs. Eames, and she's going to tell us how she helps Charles design his chairs. Um, so dreadful examples of how a woman at the height of her career, one of the most prominent and powerful designers in the 20th century, was really beset with misogyny. Um, Charlotte Perrian, we all know. Now she has the recognition she deserves, but early in her career, when she applied to work at the hallowed studio of architect Le Cabousier, she, the response she received was rather curt. He said, we don't embroider cushions here. Then, of course, she went on to design most, if not all, of his significant furniture pieces. Didn't get the credit at the time. Now, thankfully, she does. One less so famous, but it's an area that I'm very interested in, um, graphic design and typography. A wonderful, very eminent 20th century typographer, writer and scholar, Beatrice Ward, could only ever get her work published if she wrote under the pseudonym of a man, Paul Beaujean. She realized there was no way she would be taken seriously or get published in this. Back in those days, the early 20th century, typography design it was still felt to be an arm of the printing industry. 
and the printing industry, of course, was very masculine. She was so successful of writing under Paul Beaujon that in 1927, he was offered the part-time post to be the editor of the Monotype Recorder, which was her magazine at the time. She, Beatrice, accepted, but to the astonishment of the Monotype Corporation's executives in London, because of course they were expecting a man to turn up. And they were astonished, a little horrified, but she fought on. The final one is in fact the most shocking, and I have an image to show that after I've read the statement down. This was given to me by Libby Sellers last night, she reminded me. The BBC, in 2014, so, you know, yesterday, they broadcast a documentary, a three-part documentary, which tells the story of British architects, the Brits who built the modern world. And those architects were Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, Nicholas Grimshaw, Terry Farrell, and Michael Hopkins of Hopkins Architects. In the original publicity photograph, it was Michael with Patty, his wife, co-founder of the company, and partner. When the programme went out, they airbrushed Patty out of the picture. Now, if that is not the most shocking tale from the BBC, they apologised afterwards, said it was a misunderstanding. They felt that Michael felt it was more appropriate, only he was represented. But here is a case of literally photoshopping, Stalinistic, removing a partner, 50% of Hopkins Oxford. Anyway, I thought I'd start with that kind of shocking one. I was reminded earlier, actually, there was another famous, infamous picture about three years ago from Salone that Paola Antonelli put up on her Instagram, which was the opening ceremony. It was a wall of, very nice, I'm sure, elderly gentlemen in grey or navy blue suits. It was the hierarchy, the VIPs of Salone de Mobili. Not a single woman in that group. We know and we are happy that things are changing, things have changed. We now have um, Mrs. Porro as the, the director and the photograph this time, I haven't seen it but I was informed, is her in the front cutting the ribbon with all these eminent men in her shadow, shall we say. So positive things have happened, things are moving in the right direction. But on that subject matter, um, the pendulum that does need to swing, I feel, I think most people, need to, most people feel. I'd like to start back with Lily again online. And Lily, do we see you? She's back. Lily, I'd like to throw it to you because you have said in, your, in the press release, in the opening statement before you joined Mac, that one of your primary missions, as well as opening it up and doing the things you've done, is to put the female perspective into, into the Mac Museum. And actually both Tolga and Alexandra were interested to say the feministic uh, point of view actually was the quote. And actually we're all interested in how you think you can address that. A, what, elaborate on that, why you think it is necessary to have this feministic point of view and how you will go about doing that. Is that too harsh a question? No, it's, it, it is not. Um, and uh, I think, again, uh, you made an introduction to that with uh, your episode on, on uh, Charles and Ray Ames. Yeah? They have always worked as a team, uh, but uh, also at this museum, the Eames exhibition was very strongly focusing on Charles. And uh, uh, to, to sort of uh, look at the museum with a female gaze, to, to look with a female perspective, uh, means to point out uh, biographies, to, to maybe put stories in history right, uh, and uh, uh, point out the achievements of female partners, if they were only only partners, yeah. but uh, yeah, of course we have uh, uh, a lot of, of uh, female designers in the past uh, uh, that we should look back on, uh, but I think uh, the same is true uh, for contemporary designers um, or in architecture uh, that, yeah, we sometimes have to remind ourselves to to, to take new viewpoints, be it on one hand to, 
to emphasize looking on uh, female carriers or at uh, an, another point, uh, of course, uh, to, to leave the Eurocentric uh, perspective that we frankly uh, mainly have uh, uh, at the moment. So I think it's 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 not only this point, but uh, uh, this is uh, this is strong argument, and it's not uh, rewriting history, but uh, but tell stories that have been untold. Okay, so it's you, you're not rewriting; you're just telling the truth, writing from scratch in a sense. Is that a good way of putting it? Yeah. Tolga, would you, would you agree with that? Or Ale Alexandra wants to say something. I, I was just going to say to, to Lily's point, I think that the people who are interested, and I emphasize people because I, I think too often it's considered to be a, a woman's work to think about gender equity, but the people who are interested in gender equity are also very much interested in racial equity and economic equity and to trying to build, especially, you know, we're talking about institutions, teams within institutions that are not homogenous, that bring a variety of perspectives to bear so that we can adequately interpret stories, build collections, create partnerships that are meaningful. And that represent the world as broad as the world is. Mm. Olga? Well, there's a lot to do, I would say. Yeah, I mean, Lily pointed out the Eurocentric uh, point of view that European museums have, and and uh, and even so, back then when these type of museums were built, they were super interested in, let's say, East Asia and these kind of things because they knew how inspiring it was. There's a lot to do. Yeah, we're still very white. Um, so in general, I mean, it's it's quite overwhelming in a way because you immediately bring in the diversity of people as you know a more broader understanding of communities uh, and, and I am aware that uh, we still don't know enough about the women that have been in design history working, doing interesting work and when we did an exhibition on uh, female designers for um, a German company called Deutsche Werkstätt in Hellerau, um, we found out that you know very often you find work of a woman you know, labeled as the work of a former husband or something like that. So that even in you know, research means you really have to dig deep, deep as a, to kind of find the stories. And when you look at your own collection, um, as I mentioned before, our graphic design curator, she's really recollecting um, female positions because we don't have them. Yeah? And they were there. And they were so often just not put into the books, not uh, researched, not mentioned, not named. So it's... Yeah, until we get to the point to have the real diversity we need, uh, that this is an issue we still have to. But to Tilda, look do at. you feel these are missions? Um, and as you say, they are there. Those designers, artists are there. They just weren't presented. Was that because there was primarily a male Western opinion? Well, so when, I, when I studied design, I studied design um, 1986 to 92. Uh, I studied, all my teachers were male, um, all, my com all my students, colleagues were male, uh, we were like four or five uh, women in the class. Um, the history they taught me was male, and I didn't even doubt it. I mean, I really have to admit, I did not doubt it back then. I thought, okay, that's the design history. I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't afraid of going into it, but in the end, I'm not a designer. I'm a design theorist and I'm a museum director. So why am I not a designer fighting in the technical design world? I don't know. I mean, did I move out? Did I, you know, one moment say, okay, I'll take a side route, which yes. is successful, obviously, but, uh, but I didn't go into the, the hardcore business. So why is that? So I think, yes. That's a, an extraordinary statistic, and it's, again, not long ago. It's uh, 20, 30 years ago. When, but you've seen that change now. Uh, Absolutely. It, There's yeah. a lot of change going and it's, on. And it no? feels... Don't you think? Yeah. Alexander, yes. It feels the pace is fast, and it's accelerating, and it needs to. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more. You mentioned in your presentation, Alexander, the, the toolkit you've been working on for museums institutions generally, um, addressing all issues. Can you elaborate a bit on, on that? Because it sounds uh, interesting. Well, the, the premise of, of the toolkit is that through changing museum experience, you're changing the institutions themselves. 
And when you really are thinking about the experience of people, peoples in museums, um, it's, it's a transformative act. Um, and, and the idea behind creating a, a toolkit, right, as opposed to maybe just, you know, um, an edited volume that includes essays uh, from various perspectives on this topic, is so that people who are interested in working in all different types of institutions and who may not be in leadership positions also, because you know, there still is not internationally enough diversity in, in leadership positions, are able to make change within the institutions. And so how do you, you know, activate if, um, if you, know, you don't feel as though you are in um, a position of power or you're not an administrator. And there are so many ways um, through design thinking in particular that you can build consensus, um, that you can create collaboration between departments. Many of us who work in collecting institutions know there's a big drive to try to have conversations in between communications, education, um, curatorial, and historically, you know, these, these different disciplines within the museum have often been kept separate. Um, and so this, this idea of collaboration, of communion, you know, is, is something, you know, they've almost become buzzwords, right? And, but we can't, we, we can't take our eye off the prize, really, you know, which is that they, they are essential to pushing institutions forward in a way um, that makes them not just, you know, in service uh, to the people who work for them and also to, you know, various audiences, um, but, but to history. And how does it manifest itself? How is it, how are you building this toolkit? It's a group of people, is it? Yeah, there was a group of 15 museum professionals who came together um, and from visitor experience, from curatorial, from digital departments, um, from education. Um, and we all talked about what our definition of a museum was, what our tactics and goals were within our own institutions for inciting change. Um, we talked about our careers. We talked about the tools that had been most meaningful to us. Um, and, and we put all of these conversations together in a very transparent way uh, because, of course, we were meeting remotely because of COVID on a digital whiteboard. We were constantly sort of modeling, uh, adding references. You know, this, this isn't the first toolkit of its kind that's been published, um, but it, it was, you know, it, to some degree, a, a, an act of, of rebellion and also an invitation to participate in this process. Yeah. Oh. I, I think you mentioned a couple of things that I find really interesting, um, and we're doing it in a similar slash different way, but, but I think these are the clues and of, of changing an institution being a very a closed shop, you know, very hierarchical, um, telling the, the one only story to opening up into an institution that has many voices, many stories, and to really understand that we don't have uh, the only um, uh, truth or the own, we, we are the, the knowledge. I mean, we are keepers, yes, we are keepers of objects, but we are not the only ones telling the story about the objects. And your Willie Smith uh, project tells that in, in a wonderful way, I think. And maybe that is, so in parallel to, to um, yeah, in the way that institutions are changing, that is certainly will help, or I hope it will help, to include people that usually feel excluded because they're, they're not addressed. They don't feel meant. They don't feel heard or seen or, or invited. So I think this is something that is, if we talk about institutions, there's a, there's a crucial change going on right now. So it's another transformation we're seeing with this, this lessening that talking down elements, which, yeah, again, when I grew up, when I was educated, you did feel you were just there to absorb what you were told, and there was less of an, inc an, an inclusive thing. Lily, can I just bring you back in, um, just to, because we'd just like to see your face as much as anything else. Where's Lily? I'm back. <laughs> You're back. Um, I'm, yeah, um, uh, I can only agree with, uh, uh, with what Alexandra and, and Tulga said. 
Um, because you man, uh, mentioned Alice Rawson before, uh, I think we, it, it's uh, always good to also remember what uh, Alice did when she was uh, director of the Design Museum in London with uh, a program that uh, took very different uh, perspectives at that time. Yeah? And um, that was then considered by some people not being serious design or not be enough. She certainly uh, ruffles uh, feathers. This, this yeah. is other um, other threads you have to follow and other arguments you have to take besides uh, the ones that we are now discussing. Uh, thankfully that, that, that things have changed in this, uh, I, I think it's been 20 years since, since Alice was at the Design Museum. Yes. But um, yeah, um, I'm I'm happy about uh, this uh, this change of uh, perspectives and and of uh, the possibilities uh, that we have also to change uh, uh, institutions uh, in the way that they see themselves and to, to open museums up in uh, various ways. Yes, exactly. Um... I can't believe how quickly the time has raced. I know we're not on a strict schedule, are we? But we can carry on a little bit more. I would like to throw it out to the audience for some questions, um, if, if we have any, because I think it is such an interesting subject. And we have three incredible speakers here. So please, I'll just, get, I'll just add one more thing. I'll be devil's advocate for a second um, before we throw the, the question out. And I mentioned this when we had our Zoom call. This pendulum has to swing, of course, and often pendulums swing much further one way before it settles. Um, should, if I were a young industrial designer graduating now, should I be worried that maybe, no matter how good I am, I might not get the exposure I should deserve because this pendulum has to swing another way and maybe there's just no room for me to get the exposure I possibly would have had 20 years ago? Um, I find something else really interesting that more, I mean, that you see so many collectives and there is a, there's a change in the way designers are working in my opinion. It's not, it's not anymore. I mean, even so, I'm, I'm, I recently had a very interesting debate with a, like, like an interview, like a podcast on, on the name, uh, you know, the designer star or the author designer. And if that's gone, and, and I really like actually this, the concept because it's also a brave concept. If you're a designer like uh, Konstantin Gritschic or whoever, you have to stand with your name for your quality. Uh, but, so I, I like that. Um, but on the same time, I really am fascinated by the fact how many designers go into collectives, they become groups, they collaborate differently. They're not at all anymore just the one solo person, uh, you know, running a whole business. They work, you know, com open source and, and so many more things. So in my opinion, it's become such a different kind of field in a way that I don't fear, I don't see that, that, that you don't get the exposure yeah. anymore. And, I, and, and particularly, I don't know if that's something I'm just seeing, but I... I know quite a quite a number of really tough young French women, and they have like a quality to them that I find. So I'm not afraid about you know not being exposed yes. uh, or getting overlooked if you don't want it. No. So in a positive sense, it's that it's just that that era of the big yes. ego right. solo designer is over, which is not a bad thing. Alexandra, would you? But two things come to mind: is that they're they're so many, as you were mentioning, Tulga, resources, alternative resources for young designers and, um, and architects that are springing up. Uh, Esther Choi's Office Hours, which provides educational resources online for BIPOC designers and, and architects and artists. Um, you know, Michelle Muller Fisher and the work that she's doing, and also art museums and transparency, which is you know publishing salaries on an anonymous spreadsheet. Um, you know, their information is flowing much more freely. And then you also see exhibitions. I talked a little bit about Willie Smith and how we were discussing a network 
of creativity, you know, that sort of saw him as a nucleus, the way we talk about historical design events is different. And through our research, you know, we really began to understand that you couldn't talk about Willie Smith also without talking about his business and creative partner, Lori Mallet, or that when we were talking about, you know, site architects projects in the 70s and 80s, a lot of emphasis went on James Wines, but there wasn't as much on Alison Skye and Michelle Stone, who were co-founders of site with him at that time. Um, you know, Zoe Ryan's In a Cloud and a Wall and a Chair talks about these sort of, you know, constellations of creativity. So, you know, within these sort of alternative spaces and also in institutional spaces, there is really reflected, you know, this breakdown of the, of the, of the hero myth. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think that's a, that's a positive move, as, as we say. So any questions from the floor? We have a microphone, yes, gentlemen there. Thank you for the uh, inspiring discussion, but I uh, think we should not be too optimistic and we have to fight, <laughs> we all have to fight uh, not to, to fall back in, in former uh, uh, strategies and, and uh, uh, faults and, and so on. And as researchers or journalists, like I am a journalist, I try uh, to look at the real thing and uh, for instance uh, Konstantin always uh, told told us who was in charge for a, a project for instance Pauline Delfour uh, 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 you mentioned some stories before uh, there's also uh, Denise Scott Brown uh, and the uh, Pritzker the Prize Pritzker. Uh, yeah Let's make it. Oh, yeah. I could have talked for three hours <laughs> about the, ex the examples. No, very, very good point, but just one cannot be um, complacent at this moment. Any other urgent question? One behind. Anyway, it's wonderful to get a little bit of the Salone from <laughs> I that? miss you all so much. I, I would have loved to join. <laughs> and it's very different. It's uh, amazing, the change. It was so, clear that this would be a year like we haven't witnessed yeah, in a long time. It's unique. Some incredible uh, new ways of presenting and innovations, the sustainability, everything here will be recycled. Um, it's, it's some very positive things happening. You want me in tears because I'm not there. <laughs> it's the best year ever, Lily. You missed it. <laughs> Question? So, hello, thank you very much. My name is Stephanie. I'm writing on design and I'm based in Zurich. And um, I would like to understand a little bit of what you think about um, young designers in the economy because I my experience is when I go and visit young designers female or male designers in their studios it's not so much about gender equity anymore but it's about the question how can one really be seen in the industry because many of the young designers have or they go to the big companies they deliver their ideas they show projects and maybe they are accepted and maybe they are not. And if they are accepted, they have to develop their projects to a very, very high uh, level, basically ready to be produced. And then um, it's possibly showcased through the, um, or produced in, and then seen through the industry. So to me, I would like to know what your opinion uh, is on that. And if um, the industries restraints possibly have also something to do with not being seen and not so much gender equality. Tolga. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, good question. Um, at the beginning when you talked, I thought, well, never before have so many designers been educated. So the production of how many young designers leave university every year is enormous. So that not everybody can be seen or be successful is kind of, sadly enough, the logic of, of, of competition. 
but the restraint of industry certainly is uh, is a fact. Uh, also, the the fact that industry has stopped being um, experimental at all. Um, we, I mean, companies like. Especially when you're here in Italy, a company like Olivetti would not uh, exist anymore. A company that, you know, really literally allowed Ettore Sotsos to just, you know, do his completely um, experimental work and still have a job at Olivetti working for them. It's just amazing. Yeah. So these things and the and the fact that everything is already tested through marketing before it ever sees the light and you almost not have it anymore. Yes, the industry has become extremely restrained, I'm totally sure. But at the same time, when you go here, you look at the graduation show, the last graduation show. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff where I think, okay, how many more material experiments do I have to see of hemp and, and, and I don't know, mist cells and some kind of board, uh, because I've seen too many. Um, but on the other hand, you always stumble across amazing work and there's talent. And talent, in my opinion, if they have the power, they will get through. And, and through, you know, creating for so many, many years, when you find somebody who is interesting and you'll drop, you know, you know, you stumble upon the same person again next year, somewhere else in, in Milano, and then again, and then, you know, okay, he or she is going to make it, maybe not in the industry, but, but will make it. So I'm quite positive that it's about creativity in general. And I mean, the, the, the next to industry, it's also media. I mean, media is also a tough partner in the whole thing. Yeah, who who is who is picked out and why? Yeah, and why is suddenly, um, if somebody has a more foreign name, um, it becomes more exciting, maybe. And, and so I find it very very difficult today. And we're also quite hysteric. I mean, everybody's so super sensitive about saying the wrong thing and the right thing. So it's not an easy time. But I'm, I would say, what do you say, Alexandra? On Lily. Yeah, I, I think it's our responsibility to, you know, as consumers, as curators, as journalists, to put pressure on the industry to support designers. Like, we all have to think about the pipeline for design careers um, and, and what we can do to support creativity and sustain it, right? Because that's the problem. You know, there may be a moment where, you know, there's a hyper awareness around a particular talent, but then how does that career last for a lifetime? And so industry is a big part of it. Also the possibility of independent studio practice and the gallery system and institutions. There, there really is an ecosystem. So no one, no one can pass the buck completely. It, it's, it's a responsibility of, of everyone who cares about design. And actually I think designers. institutions have a wonderful opportunity to, to allow experiments, for example. In my opinion, that is one of the big chances we have as in, in the institution itself. Being, and that's why I would say it's not only about collecting, preserving, you know, researching and, and educating, but also about opening up the possibility of producing and making something yeah. become, you know, be, become real. It's a wonderful thing we could put into that um, whole thing. Another thing that I'd like to add, uh, as we have uh, the University of Applied Arts uh, uh, sort of in the same building block, uh, I think uh, design education has so dramatically changed. I mean, how, how, how would, uh, I think uh, it's important to educate uh, today's designers in, in very general skills. Uh, because you will have to retrain at uh, certain points in your life. There is not this one education that you could take and then become more skilled, uh, uh, because I think the changes are more fundamental. At the same time, I, I think uh, design, especially in the past one and a half years, has shown how much creativity and design uh, can contribute to society. And that uh, sort of enlightens the role of uh, of uh, creatives and and designers and uh, and uh, yeah raises the awareness for what this discipline can do for society and I think this is an important point uh, added to what uh, Tuga and Alexandra said uh, in terms of media and uh, industry. Uh, it's again rethink what is the skills that we need to educate people 
in in order to give them the basics of an education that they will have to very individually uh, structure throughout their career. Yes, very well. No, education, as always, is is paramount. And thank you. It's a terrific question. Time for one more, if there is one more question. Because we're running way over. Well, I think we can just we can wrap up. And um, I'd just like to thank, actually, I'd like to thank a few people before we wrap up. The people who would arrange, the, organized and arranged and invited us. Um, Maria Cristina Diderot, of course, the curator of these talks. I'd like to thank her and her team, Patricia Malfatti, Vladka Zanoletti, and Elisabetta Piccariello. Um, who've been incredible in their efficiency, their kindness, their talent. And all women, of course, all women, just shows you. And I'd like to thank the three guests um, for going easy on me. Thank you very much. Much kinder than my sisters were when I was going. Thank you, and Tony. Thank you for coming and engaging. Thank you very much.